Well, welcome to Walking with Jesus. We are in Lesson 28, and Jesus heals a paralytic. We're going to talk today about how to be a true friend. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, here is our timeline. We're coming into the, right here at the top of the 30, Jesus' 31st birthday. We don't know if we're before or after exactly. We don't even know what day of the, of the year he was born, but he was born. We know that much. Well, how to be a true friend? This guy, Jesus, is absolutely fabulous. I've never heard anyone speak like he does or do the wonderful things that he does. He has some kind of magic power that can cure people of all kinds of diseases, maladies, or infirmities. He has given sight to the blind. He's cured a leper by touching him. He cured a man who was possessed with a demon and it has never returned. The guy is normal and healthy. Wouldn't you like to have seen that? Well, and the way he speaks, as if he has great authority. He doesn't have to refer to anyone else as his source of authority like I do. No, I refer to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and Jesus as my source of authority for what I share with you. Jesus didn't have that problem. He knows the Old Testament extremely well and helps us to understand it so much better than the scribes and the priests do. Oh, what I would give for just one hour face to face with Jesus. <clears throat> well, we're in Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 8, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. Jesus is going to teach us how to be a true friend. So, first of all, everybody wants to razzle dazzle. Luke 2, 1 through 2, Luke 5, or Mark 2, 1 through 2, and Luke 5, 1 to 17. A few days later, one day, Luke says, when Jesus again entered Capernaum and the people heard that he had come home, so many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. When he preached the word, he was teaching to them. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law had come from every village of Galilee, from Judea from Ju and Jerusalem, and were sitting there, and the power of the Lord was present to heal the sick. So Jesus has just returned to Capernaum after spending several days, maybe even weeks, preaching and performing miracles in the other cities around Galilee. He did not stay in Capernaum it was, uh, uh, all the time. Uh, and Jesus has got to the point to where now he's a celebrity. Remember back to the first year of Jesus, he was a kind of obscurity. Who's Jesus? Nobody knows who he is. I fight that challenge even yet today. Who's Glenn? Nobody knows who he is. Jesus here called to solve his problem faster than I've solved mine. So he has developed a, a reputation. He's developed notoriety. He, people are now beginning to figure out who Jesus is. And they want to hear him speak. They want to see him do another miracle. He has become a celebrity that is now so popular he draws a crowd like bees to a beehive. He's growing quite a fan club. Are you a member of Jesus' fan club? Now, on one occasion, Jesus is in a, is in a house in Capernaum, and all the rooms, probably if there were any doors or windows, people are hanging out the doors or hanging out in the windows, trying to get a word of what Jesus is saying. They want to hear him speak. Now, four men who have heard about Jesus' miracles, and they believe what Jesus can do, and they've got a friend who's paralyzed. So Jesus, uh, they bring this friend who's paralyzed to Jesus on a stretcher so Jesus can heal him, but because of the crowd, they can't find a way in. So, to a certain degree, the people aren't yet understanding Jesus as their Lord and their Savior and the forgiver of their sins. They just know he's a great teacher. He does some awesome miracles. They're caught up in the razzle-dazzle. They just think this is spectacular. And We've been there. There's been somebody who had a good reputation, an entertainer or an athlete or a, a speaker or someone like that, and you just wanted to go here and just see what they would do. And that's kind of where the people are right now. Here's a picture of the synagogue in Capernaum as they believe it looked in Jesus' day. And a little bit of what it looks like today. We'll show you another picture here in a minute. Is that how, uh, they, Glenn, is that how they spelled Capernaum? Capernaum. 
Capernaum. P-H? That's how they spelled it there. Sometimes with the H, sometimes without the H. Uh, here's kind of the floor plan. Here's the main part of the, of the uh, synagogue, and then this was kind of a wing area. Uh, I don't know if that was a meeting room or what they did there. Right down in this corner is kind of a, a pit, which could have been used for a baptistry or for ceremonial washings. And that's a picture of it right down here in the, in the lower corner. Uh, you can see the uh, synagogue in this area. Peter's house is approximately right in here. And the Sea of Galilee is right here. So we're not talking more than about 50 yards from the water's edge to the synagogue. And Peter's house is somewhere in between. And these are other people that lived in Capernaum crowded around. How would you like it if the only distance between you and your neighbor was a stone wall about that thick? But I get the impression from what I've seen of some of these ruins that that's about all they had between them in some of those houses was just a stone wall. Sometimes the rule keepers are wrong. Hmm, that sounds a little hot out to be a true friend, but you got to know when the rule keepers are wrong. And let's talk about it. Some men came, Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, Mark chapter 2, verses 3 through 7, and Luke 5, verses 18 to 21. Some men came and brought to him a paralytic on a mat, carried by four of them, and they tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. But since they could not find a way to do this, to get him to Jesus, because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus after digging through it and lowered him on the mat the paralyzed man was lying on, threw the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. <clears throat> now when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, or friend, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and, and the teachers of the law that were sitting there said to themselves, or were thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So the Jews and the Pharisees and the scribes are as far away as Jerusalem. That's about 70 miles. That would take about, if you walk. If you were a good walker, you could probably do 25 miles a day. Uh, that's a pretty good hike. Dad did a Boy Scout, uh, was a scout master for a period of time, took the Boy Scouts on a 50 mile hike. They did it in two days. They were going to do it in a little over two, but they guys said, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And they got it done, they got it done in two days. So I know that 25 miles, and that's over just Kansas. You know, rolling hills, nothing quite like the hills that there are in Galilee and, and uh, Judea. But to go downhill from Jerusalem to the Jordan River, cross over the Jordan River, go up to uh, Galilee, and then walk around the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum, that's a good two to three, probably a three-day walk for most people. And yet they want to hear what Jesus has to say. They're willing to take the time away from work and away from home to travel three days to hear him speak. Don't know how long they stayed, but then they've got to walk three days back to get back home. They're gone for at least a week, maybe more, just to hear Jesus speak. Do you have some pet teaching or beliefs that you think you have to protect? So this is part of the idea of the Pharisees. They, they think that they're the watchdogs, they're the guard dogs, uh, and the scribes also. Uh, of the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, the teachings of the Jews. And so they're going to listen to anybody who comes in teaching something new to make sure he is conforming to their standards and, and he's playing by their, by their rules. They're not examining them by God's rules. They're examining by all the rules that they've added to God's rules. They mean well. Really, they do. But they're so mistaken that here they are uh, we're going to find out, they're going to find uh, reason to object to Jesus because they see his success. They're kind of jealous and envious of it and even threatened by it because they counter some of their stuff. Eventually, at approximately about a year from now, they're going to start to really turn on him. And, of course, that's going to go until they get him onto the cross. So sometimes the rule keepers are wrong. They consider themselves guardians of the law and they want to check Jesus out. And find out whether he's truly teaching 
by their definition. I've seen some leaders in a church sometimes are more worried about guarding the preacher and whether he was preaching right than they were about taking care of the members of the church, <coughs> seeing that they're growing in their walk with Christ and not getting into things that Christians shouldn't be getting into. So these Pharisees, these scribes, will eventually, the most of them, not all of them, we can't just say everybody does this, but a lot of them will eventually become Jesus' greatest enemies and they will do anything and everything they can to find a way to get him killed. And of course the only way they succeed is that Jesus allows them to do it. We'll have fun with that when we get to the last part of uh, the Walking with Jesus Bible study. So do you look for the good in others? Or are you look, busy looking for things to fight and fault with? One of the little objections I have with some of these magazines in the check stand at the grocery store. All they do is bash people for the most part. Uh, most of that is just putting people down. I don't know why we think, and, and we do this a lot, whether we, we need to check ourselves when we're talking about the other people. Is what we're saying about them good and uplifting and true and, and worthy of knowing? Or are we just trashing them and tearing them down, maybe thinking that we looked better than them because we're not doing what we're accusing them of doing? Sell, I don't know. They wouldn't sell magazines. Well... Unfortunately, yeah, they do that because it sells magazines and, and so many of the people in the world, and again, you know, just because we're Christians doesn't mean that we don't get caught up in this battle ourselves of sometimes trashing other Christians because they don't believe the way we do, and so they're wrong. And we need to constantly examine what we say about other people and why we say about other people and how it conforms by God's standards. So, do you look for the good in others? Or do you look for things that you can use to tear them down? Here is another picture of this synagogue in, in Capernaum. Uh, this is the main part here. That little baptistry I was telling you about, or pit, uh, uh, washing pit, it just over the other side of this wall right here in the corner. And then it came out this way for a little ways. I, again, I don't know what the part of it was there. And uh, there's ruins around, all the way around this building. Now, you can look at these walls here. These are the walls of a house. Is this just one house? Or is this a, a people on this side and people on this side and more people over here? I could not begin to tell you. But look how thick they are. And if that's a, an apartment or a condo type dwelling, that's what you have between you and your neighbor. I don't think sound travels through rock all that well, but still... That is our house in Capernaum. Well, people are more important than rules. Matthew chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. Mark chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And Luke 5, 22 to 24. Knowing their thoughts, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take up your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. So, rather than retreat, the four men are trying to interrupt the meeting. They take the man to the roof of the house, they tear a hole in it, they lower him down to Jesus, they believe so strongly that Jesus can heal him, they care so much about their friend that they will do, stop at nothing to get him to Jesus. How much do you want Jesus to touch you? Or maybe someone in your life? <clears throat> Jesus is speaking. And can you imagine that? He's in the room smaller than this, more than likely, crammed full of people, and he's talking to them. There's people at the door, there's people at the window, there's people at this door, and people are hanging out there trying to see if they can just hear a little bit of what he's saying. Shh, I'm trying to listen. And Jesus is talking, and I'm sure he had a ability to project well, and all of a sudden, scratch, 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 and all of a sudden, dirt starts falling down on the crowd. What? Oh! Ah, man, what 
is going on up there on the roof of this house? And the dirt scratching and the more stuff falling and, and soon there's some daylight. As a, uh, the, Luke mentions that they removed some tiles. So maybe the roof was a tile roof. So they'd have to lift those tiles, slide them out of the way uh, to make a hole big enough. Uh, Jesus speaking over, and, and a hole appears in this roof of this man's house, and it gets larger and larger until probably, now if they laid the guy down on a stretcher like this, he's probably about six foot tall. They've got to have a little room at both ends to kind of get through, unless they fished him down, you know, kind of down in. We're talking a hole, a minimum of maybe six to seven feet by three feet that they would make in this guy's roof. And down through the hole comes somebody on a stretcher bed being lowered by four friends. What are you doing to my roof? Are you going to fix that when you get done? Am I going to have to worry about rain coming in when the rainy season comes? How would you like to be interrupted uh, in the middle of listening to Jesus speak to you? Here we got this wonderful conversation going on. I'm listening to Jesus. He's saying such wonderful things. And, and we get interrupted by these guys that think that they can rip the roof off my house and just lower this guy down. Now, Dr. Luke mentioned that the man's specific malady is palsy. Palsy is a muscular paralysis caused by a nervous disorder. Jesus looks at the man on the stretcher. He sees the faith of the four friends up there. And instead of saying, you're healed, he calls the man son. And he tells him that his sins are forgiven. Now, in the Old Testament, the idea, the Old Testament, the Jews had this idea that if you've got a sickness, it's because you've got sin in your life. And we could talk about situations where sin and stress has caused a lot of sickness. I can think of the times when I would catch a cold and most of the time when I caught a cold, I could look back and say I was anxious or stressed out about something the day before I caught that cold. And then I just got enough exposure to a cold germ, the next thing you know, I'm coughing, my nose is running, my sinuses are running, and life is not happy. But I can relate a lot of that to the stress that I've gone through. And a lot of people would tell you a lot of cancer is caused by stress, <clears throat> or at least fueled by it. And uh, actually, probably a lot of physical maladies are the result of stress. Uh, sometimes I'm worried about, oops, I did something I wasn't supposed to do. I hope I don't get caught. You know, that's, that will cause stress for sin in your life. So there may be some thought to that, but, but that, that's kind of the general Jewish mindset. Whether it's really always true. Now, we, we come a little bit further along. We know that not all... Illness and sickness and disease are caused by stress. Sometimes you get around somebody that's got something, you catch their germ, and now you've got it, and you may not have been all that stressful about it. You were just caught by a germ that your defense system wasn't ready to fight against. Outrage. What? How can a man forgive sins? The scribes and the Pharisees are very quick to declare that only God can do that. Now, the Old Testament gives this ability to the Messiah would you have been able to believe in Jesus or would you have been with the side with the Pharisees and the scribes? If you didn't know any more about Jesus than, you, than they know, they just know he's a good teacher and he does a lot of great miracles. Would you have believed in him or would you have said, wait a minute, what's this charlatan doing thinking he can go around forgiving people of their sins? That's a hard question to answer, isn't it? Well, obedience gets results. Matthew chapter 9, verses 7 to 8, Mark 2, 12, Luke 5, verses 25 to 26. The man got up immediately. Whoo, there's that word. He stood up in front of them and went home. He took his mat, what he'd been lying on, and walked out and went home praising God in full view of them all. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and amazed, this amazed everyone Everyone was amazed as they praised God. They were filled with awe. They praised God who had given such authority to men, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Or Luke says, we've seen remarkable things today. Well, I'd say that'd be pretty remarkable. Jesus is a mind reader. 
And he's fully aware of the shock effect of his statement, and he uses that to teach a point. The point is, he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He does have the power to forgive sins. Now, we were talking a little bit ago about everybody, sometimes the rule keepers are wrong. Now we're talking about obedience, and the difference between the rule keepers in the earlier conversation and the rule keepers now being obedient is who makes the rules. The problem is that when the Pharisees made the rules, their rules went beyond and, and lost sight of God's rules. And here again, there's our challenge. Am I following God's rules or am I making up my own rules as I go along? And we struggle with that. And you will struggle with that. It's not an easy. The Bible's clear. Love God with your heart, soul, mind, and spirit. Love your neighbor as yourself. But how do I go about doing that? Sometimes we say, well, we got to love God this way. And so our church has these little routines, rituals, traditions. This is how we love God. You guys are wrong because you don't do it the way we do it. And we'll see somebody come out with a new thing and they'll say, oh, this is the latest and the greatest and this is really how you love God. And we'll say, oh, we got to do that because that's what they're doing and it's working great for them. And uh, fortunately, God's a God of grace. But now, those are things that aren't necessarily confirmed by Scripture. So we got to look back. Are the rules that we're obeying God's rules or my rules? And if they're God's rules, then obedience is very important. And if Jesus says, take up your mat and go home, you want to obey. To prove that this man is forgiven, Jesus tells him to take up his bed and go home, which he does in full view of everyone in the room and many who can see the doors through the doors and the windows. The healing is immediate, as if he had never been ill. His healing is complete, muscles restored and full functionality established. Now, I don't know if he was skinny legs from atrophy, from being paralyzed for so long, if all of a sudden his limbs build up muscle, or if just what little muscle he had left uh, was strong enough all of a sudden to carry him and, and carry him out of the room. But this guy, we don't know how long he'd been uh, an invalid. But all of a sudden, he's walking around just like he never had a problem with his muscles in his life. That's amazing. And, of course, we have reason to believe that his healing was permanent. Jesus healing the man is a testimony that he, does not, that he does have the power to forgive sins. Therefore, he is the Son of God. Therefore, if Jesus were not the Son of God, he would be stoned for blasphemy. And he is the Son of God. We have an obligation to seek him out, to seek what he teaches, and... Be obedient to what Jesus says. That is our goal and our calling. The people respond with praise and amazement beyond their ability to express it. What they just saw is beyond human comprehension. That just This just doesn't happen. Doctors have not been able to cure people of palsy. Jesus comes in, eh, it's just like taking an aspirin, getting a drink of water, no big deal. You're cured of palsy. Now, complete, permanent, forever. What they just saw is beyond their comprehension. Would you be amazed and praise God? Or would you be skeptical and criticize Jesus? This goes back to the question we asked a little bit ago. Would you have been like the Pharisees? Or would you have been like maybe the four friends who said, I know Jesus can heal this guy? Well, our conclusion is this. If Jesus can forgive this man of his sins, he can also forgive you and me. And being healed of a physical malady is wonderful. But how much more wonderful to be healed of the disease of sin? Now, if you've been healed of cancer or you've been healed of some, uh, 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 what was the guy, oh, multiple sclerosis. We had a guy in our class this morning that when he was 38 years old had multiple sclerosis, paralyzed on his right side for over a year. And the doctors didn't know a thing they could do for him, and he didn't give up the fight. And, and you wouldn't know that guy had multiple sclerosis. Plays golf, and he's 80. Is that he hokey? said 86 years old. Is that hokey? It was hokey. He's 86. And he had multiple sclerosis when he was 38 years old, and the doctors gave up on him. Well, you know it ain't over till it's over, right, Tom? All right. So being healed of physical malady is wonderful. The heal of sin is far greater. 
Well, next week, Jesus eats dinner with a traitor. Mm, what will the Jews have to say about that? Are we going to stop here and have some discussion time and do our discussion questions?